Hey, good morning, Foundry Church. My name is Jeff Vandermolen, and I'm the ministry director and online venue pastor here at the Foundry. And I'm currently standing up in our kids' wing here at the Foundry Church. And this is a place where kids come, and they, they grow in the relationship with the Lord. They learn more about Him. And this place is just packed with children. And so we're just so excited um, for what God's doing in the lives of our children here at the Foundry. And... Um, yeah, so we're super excited about that, and we're super excited to have you joining us for worship. If this is your first time joining us, or you've come and watched several times, um, welcome. If you'd like to stay connected and up to date with what's happening at the Foundry Church, um, you can text the keyword Foundry Online to 94000 and then press the number one key. Um, a couple other announcements I have for you this morning is our Foundry um, devotionals. Uh, these devotionals we're put together by our amazing team of writers and we'll encourage and challenge you in your faith. And we are currently um, going through this series called Intersections. And for this series, we put together a pamphlet um, that includes different scripture passages that you can read throughout the week and it will prepare you for what the pastor will be talking about on the weekend. So if you have not picked up any of these, it's not too late. You can come and pick one up today. Um, you can go to our West stores in the airlock. You can pick up a hard copy. You can go to our website, foundrychurch.net, um, and scroll down. You'll find electronic copy there. Or if you live outside of West Michigan and you would like me to send you a hard copy of either of these, just send me an email online at foundrychurch.net, and I'll make sure that they get shipped out to you. I also just want to say thank you for your generosity and the giving of your offerings and God's tithes. If you'd like to give to the Foundry Church, there's a couple different ways you can do so. Um, you can go to our website, foundrychurch.net, and then click on the Give tab and follow the instructions. Or if you'd prefer, you can mail in your offering. The address of our church is up on the screen right now. All right, that's all the announcements I have for you this morning. Um, let's open in a word of prayer um, as we come together and um, prepare our hearts for worship. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that we get to gather, that we get to worship you this morning in this place or wherever we are worshiping. We know that you are there with us. Um, Father, I just praise you because you are a good father. You love us. You care about us. And you, um, you know exactly what we're going through. And I, I pray this morning that we have open hearts just to receive what it is um, that you want to say to us this morning and that, that we would act on what you're convicting us of or what you're calling us to, Lord. Um, we know that you call us to be transformed in your image. And, and Lord, we just want to know what that next step is and give us the strength to courageously step out. And Lord, I want to pray for Pastor Eric as he gives the message this morning. Um, Lord, I pray that you give him peace and give him the words to say um, as he communicates the message with us. Lord, we love you. Um, we welcome you into this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
When you need a ride, call Eric's Founder Uber Incorporated. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. All right. So, what's out at the beach? That's actually a great question, Eric. I'm really happy you asked. Okay. I'm uh, going to a seminar. And you know what? Actually, I think this could be perfect for you. A seminar at the beach? Well, no, the seminar is not at the beach, but I have these pamphlets that I'm going to hand out. And if I can get 10 people to go with me, I get to go to the pre-seminar lounge. I get to meet the speaker face to face. So, so what's this guy speaking on? Get this. The golden streets of heaven can be yours. So it's all about how there's riches in heaven, and they can be yours if you just listen to God. So if you listen to God through this guy? Well, I'm not exactly sure about how that works, but I just know I'm an ordinary guy. I'm not doing anything important. I don't have any special skills well, besides a bow staff, but oh. I'm, you know, I'm not doing anything important. But this, if I can get in on this, I think it can be my ticket. I think if I get in on this, I can retire in one, maybe two years tops. Do you mind if I swing into the fishing pier before we go to the beach? Sure. Okay, I got this guy, a friend of mine I want you to meet. He likes to go fishing once in a while. It reminds him of when he met Jesus. He met Jesus while he was fishing? Actually, he was a fisherman by trade. And um, yeah, hang on, he's right here. I see him. Hey, Peter. Pete! Oh, Eric. Come here, man. I want you to meet somebody. Hey, Eric, who's this? Hey, this is, uh, this is my buddy Lance. Actually, I was hoping you could talk with him. Yeah, I think he's got a couple of things that he needs some help with. Would you say that when Jesus called you into, into following him, that he called you into a life of prosperity and success on this earth? Oh, this has got to be a joke, right? Andrew, John, you guys back there? They had to put you up to this, right? This has to be a joke. It's not <laughs> no, a joke, right? It is not a joke. You're not getting punked, no. I swear. Seriously, I want you to talk with Lance because he's just got a few things that are mixed up. Yeah, can I hop in? Absolutely. You're going to love this guy. You guys catching anything today? Uh, they weren't quite biting. Yeah. A little too cold, I guess. Some guy wanted it a little colder. Nice. <laughs> I say you go off the other side of the pier. <laughs> One of the things I loved about Matt's teaching last week was the way he, he kind of juxtaposed or held in the tension of, are we called to a cross or are we called to a Cadillac? What we can't have both. Our comfort can't rule our calling. I want to talk to you today about calling. I want to talk to you about calling today and what it meant for Peter to be called. And, and the intentionality around um, knowing Peter's story before we taught about his calling is that we, as people who look back on history, need to know that Jesus was serious when he said, if you are going to follow me, you must take up your cross daily and follow me. I love the picture Matt painted for us last week. It's a transformative thought in our culture to get out of our comfort and get into the calling of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't mean there won't be joy, that there won't be comfort, there won't be things that are wonderful within that calling, but it does mean this, our comfort isn't our God. God calls us according to his purposes for his glory. I want you to hear with me the calling of Peter. Matthew chapter 4, verse um, 18 and 19 and 20, it says this. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. At once they left their nets and followed him. The, the calling was quite simple. It was very straightforward. Come, follow me. Three words changed everything in their life. Three words changed everything. And when we talk about what that must have been like, it makes me think of the idea of kind of like, what does it mean to touch the stars? 
right? We all we live in a celebrity culture, an influencer culture. There are some some influencers and stars who I like, and there's some others. If I'm honest, I just want to throw a punch. I know it's not Christian, but they drive me nuts, and they're so self indulgent. But there is one guy who I did not like for the longest time, but I kind of like him now. I don't know if it's his swagger or his just kind of like, whatever, this is who I am kind of way um, with his personality. And I don't mean that in who he truly is. I think he does it in terms of his personal persona. And his Twitter, Twitter biography is really the most poignant and practical way to describe who he is. His, his Twitter biography is this. You know who I am. Yeah, right. That's awesome. Um, So Josh is up in the sound booth and he goes, oh, it's Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, it's Iron Man. It's Tony Stark, right? Like how, how great is that? You know who I am and what he does in that. And it's a weird little nuance because I found myself thinking about that. Like, why do I like that so much? It's not because I think he likes being known by everybody. I think the crush of fame would be misery to constantly be at a restaurant. Would you mind if I could have your autograph? I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're not that sorry because you're still interrupting me. But like the crush of fame would be a lot. But he, he does something in that. He brings, he brings his story to ours. You know who I am. You know who I am. We're part of this. That's the feeling I get when I think of it. There's another star who I think understands the capacity of playing your role of intersecting in ordinary lives. His, his famous line is, um, is this, no one will believe you. You know who that one is? No, he doesn't. Okay, no one will believe you. That's what this star says. He'll go up to people at a restaurant, grab, so it's Bill Murray from Caddyshack, Ghostbusters, Bill Murray, the, the great Bill Murray. Um, he goes up and he'll take a French fry off somebody's plate and eat it and he'll look at him and he'll say, Nobody will believe you. And then he leaves, and people are like, oh, Bill, Bill Murray just ate off my plate. And they're somewhere between starstruck, aghast that someone ate their papa's fritas, and, um, and then kind of like, like, like their story intersected with somebody. It's, it's kind of a big deal. And they're like, what? And what's really funny about this is that there are multiple articles out there that debunk people's claim that this happened. Meaning what? Murray was right. Nobody will believe you. It's happened. There's pictures. There's evidence of Bill Murray eating fries off other people's plates. And then there's controversy over it. And people saying, that didn't really happen. That picture's been manufactured. And it's like, it's hilarious because he's right. No one will believe you. But what the what I love about this is he brings his extraordinary life, right, of, of Hollywood and fame and being well-known. And he intersects with an ordinary life. And... um. And the feeling of nobody's going to believe that actually happened to me. It's really cool when you get to bump in to people and you do find yourself a little starstruck and excited about it. But the reality is when, when extraordinary and ordinary meet, there is a sense like you're touching the stars. And I think for Peter, his, his, He was an everyday guy. Peter was an everyday guy. He was a guy that must have felt this this rush um, that the fry victims of Bill Murray felt. Nobody's going to believe that, um, that this prophet, this force of nature, this Jesus of Nazareth has called me to follow him as a disciple. Nobody's going to believe that. He must have felt like he was touching the stars. This prophetic messianic figure tapped him for a leading role in the cultural movement of Christianity. He couldn't have, I, just think about it. He would have felt overwhelmed, but it was a basic calling. Come, follow me. I'll read it to you again. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they followed, they left their nets and followed him. So it's the ordinary transformed. 
It's the ordinary transformed. Our calling comes into our life, but our life is ordinary. And what happens is the ordinary gets transformed and something that is so normal and every day becomes different. Why? Because the presence of Jesus and the follow me of Jesus is an invitation into a life transformed. The sheer everyday ordinariness of Peter is hard to quantify. He was a hand-to-mouth fisherman who, as Matt explained last week, which was so good, man, did so good. And you should go back and rewatch that before this, honestly. It was really good teaching. But what he talks about is like he was a hand-to-mouth fisherman. His comfort would have been, for him, a comfortable life would have been not going to bed hungry in a dry place that was reasonably warm and not getting in trouble with Rome or the Jewish leaders. Pretty much it. Food shelter, no government involvement, and um, no like religious kind of theocracy involvement, not getting in trouble. That would have been comfort for him. That would have been a big deal. So, so we look at Peter and we have the unfortunate reality is you can't unknow what you know. So when it comes to Peter, we look at him and we think, Peter, Petros, the rock. You think of Vatican City in the heart of Rome, and you see these, I, having been there, I loved it, um, but there's St. Peter's Basilica, which at max capacity, it's this huge cathedral building. It can hold like 60,000 people on the floor. It is unbelievable, and the doors on it are as tall as the wall in this church. It's just unbelievable, and outside there in this massive courtyard where people will look up to the papal um, apartments where the Pope will come out and address the crowds. Like around there in that massive courtyard is a statue of Peter standing there and he's holding the keys because Jesus said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom, right? He, he's holding, it's just this imposing figure. We know Peter in our context, but there was something before the Peter we know. There's a hand to mouth fisherman trying to eke out a life under an oppressive regime and a religious theocracy. There's just a normal guy who lived an ordinary life, who was trying to get by. And how can Peter that we know be that same guy? But we love us an underdog story. Like, don't you love an underdog story? Remember the Titans? Like, I'm not saying do you remember the Titans, I'm implying you remember the Titans. Like that movie, the, the underdog story right, where this, this team that had a, a multi, multi-racial um, team integrated together with a, a head coach who was, who was not Caucasian, I mean, just being any other race than Caucasian in that time as a head coach was controversy, but he was a black man who led this team, and they, they win the championship, and we just love to see them come together and the brotherhood that was found. We love an underdog story. I love the story, um, and it's very much an unknown, but this guy uh, who's named uh, Brit Duncan, and oh, he's a Brit. Oh my God, not Brit Duncan. He's a Brit named Duncan um, Abiantine, and he left school at the age of 16. Dropped out of school, he joined the Royal Navy. Do you know how he dropped out of the Navy? He threw his commanding officer over the ship. <laughs> like, like, so clearly the guy was an underdog. He gets booted out of the Navy. Now he serves time in a in a prison for um, for military criminals. So he serves time there. He can't get a job. Nobody will talk to him. So what does he do? He ends up selling what he has, buys an ice cream truck, and works his tail off, ends up buying all his competitor's ice cream truck, sells that, takes all the money of that, invests it into a care home, and works really hard at that. Sold it for $26 million, and he's worth you know north of $100 million at this point, and he is a crazy success who came from um, throwing his commanding officer into the ocean. That's a super big deal in the Navy from what I've heard. And I just think like, I love a story like that. I love to see somebody fight and claw their way to the top. But we often don't think of the everyday ordinary people with whom we interact. We don't think of them as significant, or we don't think of them in the term that uh, Philip Smithers, who uh, started Overland Missions, he has a term for people. He calls them nation shakers. We don't think of people, these everyday ordinary people, as nation shakers. But the problem is we have our view on them, not God's view on them. And when we look at that, what we have to do is understand God 
always, always calls us out of our everyday ordinary to do something every day extraordinary. And it stays in that window of the ordinary. We're just doing ordinary things with an extraordinary mission attached to it. We're now a part of something that echoes eternally, something that has history, but also something that has an infinite future. We're part of something. Look at what happened to a historically forgettable character named Peter who encountered and intersected Jesus Christ. And he said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Do you see how he took his ordinary fishing and made it extraordinary. He said, you're not gonna fish to feed your, fill your belly. You're gonna fish to have people redeemed in my name. Come, follow me. I'll use what you're good at for what I'm best at. I love that aspect of it. Peter, For Peter, there were many everyday ordinary moments that um, he had walking with Jesus that chiseled and smoothed and formed his his testimony into historical, biblical, theological bedrock. We as the church stand on the shoulders of Peter. But what did Peter do? He walked with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. And I want to take you to a story where Peter walked with the Lord Jesus Christ. He walked with him, and it's in Matthew chapter 17, where we find Jesus inviting a few select disciples to go on a walk with him, and off they go. And it doesn't give us any hint that he's like, hey guys, got something super special to show you, come with me, but don't tell the others. It doesn't say that. It says he took them, and they walked, and they went up a mountain. They get to the top of a mountain, and, and things just kind of get really kind of strange. All of a sudden, Jesus is transformed figured in their in in their vision he is glowing and the presence of god descends on them and then jesus is talking to moses and elijah it'd be a big moment he thought he was going on a walk but walking with jesus he he sees this so peter does what would be ordinary like in his mind, this is an extraordinary event. So what does he do? He wants to grab the moment and kind of encapsulate it and make it a place you can go to. This is what Peter says. He sees Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah. And he says this, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter... He wa- Peter, like seriously, does Moses, Elijah, and Jesus need a house all of a sudden? How about we put a village up here? This is going to be awesome. We can come back here whenever we want. This place is great. I love this neighborhood. He wants to build three houses. So he has God fixed and settled in this place. That's what he wants to do. He wants to have uh, the, these places for them to be and them to dwell so that God is now there and he can go and he can have this mountaintop experience. He has this there. But while he was speaking, while he was sharing his great idea, which I think his heart is spot on, I think he desires to, to never forget this amazing moment. But while he was still speaking, it says this, a bright cloud covered them. Now, this has all kinds of Old Testament theology in it. When Moses went up Mount Sinai to get get the law from God, like he went up and it says there were just, there were clouds and peals of thunder and lightning on Mount Sinai and and Moses went up onto the mountain and came down with the law of God. It's this amazing moment. And here we are on a mountaintop with a bright light enshrouding the people that are there. So now Peter... And a couple other disciples, along with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, are enshrouded in this bright cloud that covered them. And then a voice from the cloud speaks. Oh, can you imagine? I just, like there's a part of me to be a lizard on a rock at that moment, just to be there and to hear it and to see it. The voice of God says this, this is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased. So he declares something about Jesus, but then God commands him something. Listen to him. Listen to him. Let his words bore into you and find a home in you. Listen to him. 
at the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter attempts something that we often try to do. He's so overwhelmed, he wants to build the guys a house to be on this place so he could have something built around an amazing experience and it would be then something he could quantify. It would be something where he could make a place where God is housed, where God is at, and it was a moment of mind-bending revelation. He would have been overwhelmed. I would be overwhelmed. I mean, I would love, oh man, what a great experience to be that close close to Jesus and to see Moses, whom you learned about as a child, and Elijah. And not only that, then to have the cloud, the presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God descend on you. And then God speaks, you hear him and just be like, whoa, and you'd be overwhelmed. It's understandable that he wanted to build a monument there, but it's not biblical. It's not biblical. Jesus didn't say, come follow me to this fixed moment. And then we've arrived. He said, come follow me and I will teach you to fish for men. So let's apply this to our life. Let's look at how it applies. Because it was just a walk up a mountain that had no indication it was gonna be life-changing. But once it was over, Peter didn't wanna leave. He wanted to build a town. And we wanna, leave, we wanna build things around our experiences with God. And God's not settling us to put roots into this world. He's settling us to have our roots in him. And he will move as he wills and desires. Friends, it is good and right. Hear this from me. It is good and right that we come down from the mountaintop of our experiences with God. And we come down from the mountaintops and then live fully without forgetting what we have seen and what we have heard. Remember the command of God. Listen to him. Listen to him. When you're given a mountaintop experience with God, you have to listen to it. You have to remember. Peter was told, remember, listen to the words of Jesus. God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I love him. Listen to him. Listen to him. And Peter would need to know the words of Jesus to give him hope in the darkness he was walking into. This mountaintop experience, he was probably like, oh, amazing, and wanted to tell everybody about it. It had to be just mind-boggling. But the reality is this, that Peter didn't realize that mountaintop experience and that instruction from God would be an anchor in his life that prevented him from complete disaster. Because as Matt taught last week, Peter would deny Jesus three times. But before Peter denied Jesus, there was a moment that happened at the night of the Last Supper. And I want to tell you about it and then read you a scripture. There's a moment where they are having, and it's in Luke chapter 22, where they are having the Last Supper. And a con- like literally, I just think, this is what makes me wonder if the disciples were teenagers because um, it says a dispute rose up among them about who was the greatest among the disciples. <laughs> like I laugh because the other option is beating my head on this table. They're at the last supper with Jesus the night he was betrayed, the night he would break the bread, pour the cup, bless them, and, and go into the Garden of Gethsemane. That night, their, their conversation is, you know, I think I'm more important than you. I don't know, but I've been looking at your spiritual gift survey, and you come up short, James. You're not really that good. I know, John, you think, you know, he really loves you, but I see a lot of average in you, and I'm feeling pretty good. I think I'm the most important. That is what comes up. And then Jesus challenges that. And Peter, being Peter, he's very verbal. And he stands up and he's like, I will never desert you. I will never, never desert you. You are, I, I will go with you even to death. Sounds so good. Then we read Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 31 to 30, uh, verse 31 to 34. Simon. Simon. Now remember, at this point, Peter had been given the new name, Peter Petros, the rock from Jesus. But here he calls him Simon. There's something of the old man in this. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as if you were wheat, to like filter you out. He's asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, get that? 
hear what Jesus is doing? When you turn back, what does that imply? That he's going to turn away. Jesus knows he's going to fail him, but he doesn't give up on him. His calling doesn't lift. He says, but when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you and death. And Jesus answered, I tell you this, Peter, that before the rooster crows today, you will have denied me, denied three times that you know me. Peter would need those words like you would want painkiller in a root canal. Peter would need the words of Jesus. He would need to have listened to those. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. And when you turn back, when you, the the implication that after you have failed me, when you turn back, you will strengthen your brothers, you will lead. And here's the thing, he would need those words when he realizes he not only missed his chance to show his true love for Jesus, he missed his chance and his opportunity to glorify God through giving testimony. And he denied him and even cursed a little girl. When we look at that, we, re- we, we realize the question that needs to be asked is, what did Peter need to remember? Peter needed to remember that Jesus knew he was broken. He needed to remember that Jesus knew he would fail. But here's the reality that we need to apply. That Jesus Christ calls us into faithful obedience to him. And we will fail We are going to fail him like Peter did, time and again. But will we fail forward? Will we fail and get up and not dust ourselves off and pull ourselves up by the bootstraps? But will we get up and grab onto Jesus, repent and confess that we have made a mistake? And will we live in a posture that says, I know I, like Peter, am a failure, but he's not, and he called me according to his purposes in his power, not my purposes in my power, because those will fail every time. But his purpose, his power, by his spirit cannot be beaten. And God will take our failing and he will move it and turn it into forward motion. Peter's testimony of failure is a historical blessing for you and for me that we see that someone who walked with Jesus for three years totally messed it up, yet the calling didn't lift. The come follow me, the fish for people never left. Jesus kept his calling in place. You and I are called to something. The calling exists into your everyday, ordinary life. Come, follow me. From the mountaintop experiences where the extraordinary breaks through to the darkest valleys where our failure lives before us, I will tell you this, Peter is alive in Christ because Christ called him. Your life is in Christ because he called you. And God does something with the come follow me. He does something and he begins to use us in ways that blow even our mind. We can't understand how the greatness of God can can work through a life as broken as ours. But I want to show you a way that God worked through Peter's. His very ordinary everyday life. Even after Jesus had restored him and ascended back to heaven. Peter's walking to the temple. And there is someone who has clearly been there for years and they're begging outside the temple um, for, for money so that they can survive. And, and Peter gives that famous line, silver and gold have I none, but what I have freely I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. <laughs> so awesome. Like I can't tell you, there's things in this teaching where I'm like, I super want to be there. I want to be a lizard on a rock just watching and and clapping with my little lizard hands because I just think it would be the most amazing thing to hear those words roll out of his mouth and then to see the the beggar go, what? Really? And Peter just looking at him unflinchingly and the dude's standing up. And then everybody's like, that guy's been begging here for years. Why is he walking? This is great. This is amazing. And people begin praising God. And it's this wonderful moment. It's this wonderful moment. But I want to show you who Peter is sent to to give glory to God. Peter is brought before the ruling council of the Jewish people. Remember those people he didn't want to get in trouble with who turned Jesus over to the Romans and would probably want to do the same with him? Peter probably wanted to go out and reach people, the everyday ordinary, for God. But 
you know, probably this, this is where it really comes in. This is not what I had planned. Peter does a miracle that saves somebody who, who was, was crippled and, and now can fully live. And, and he tells him the gospel story and he gives him, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And it's this wonderful moment. But all of a sudden, standing in front of the most important people in Jerusalem, Peter is given an option. Glorify God and fish for men in this pool. Do what I want of you right now because God loves them too. God loves them too. And it says this. The next day, Acts chapter four, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Um, Ananias, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the others of the high priest's family. They had um, Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them. By what power or what means did you do this? By what power or what name is actually what they say. Did you do this? And then Peter, get this, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says this, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and being asked how he was sealed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. Do you get the net image? He's like, oh, she's throwing it out as broad as he can. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Now he's laying the burden on them. There aren't Romans here this time. He's talking one-on-one to these people, this group of people. It's just him and John giving the gospel, and he says, Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. It's a, it's a quote from the Old Testament, which has become the cornerstone, the chief building block of the building. And and it's just like, oh man, it's such a cool moment. And it says, now get this, get this. They think that their salvation and their redemption is found in the law. And he says this in verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, quit telling me that you can't do it because you're a tradesman, you're a lawyer, you're a teacher, whatever. They were unschooled, ordinary men. They didn't have a theology degree. What'd they have? They had a walk with the risen Lord Jesus Christ and a relationship with him by the filling of the Holy Spirit. And they realized these unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. Now get this. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Man. Every time. I love that. They looked at them and they're like, they had been with Jesus. We should have that, church. The world should look at us and go, I don't know why they, they, they love him so much. They're ordinary people doing their ordinary thing, but their testimony of Jesus is so clear. Salvation is found in no other name. They said, by what name do you do this? And they said, by the name. And the name of God in Hebrew is sacred. The Yahweh is sacred. And he's saying, it's him. He's God. And they they were blown away. They were blown away because they were ordinary, unschooled men. And it was clear that they had been with Jesus. And the thing I would like to do to, to really wrap this up is... When we look at our life and we say this thing to ourselves, this is not what I had planned. Neither had Peter. His calling changed his plans. And then he had an immediate preconception of what his calling now would do to his life. He was gonna fish for men. And I guarantee he probably thought, I'll fish for ordinary men because I don't have the mental chops to go sit in Jerusalem with a ruling council. I don't have the capacity to do that. I'm scared of the cross, but I will will do all I can. And it, it gets past all his preconceptions, all his ideas among who's the greatest. It gets beyond all that. God works through that. And his calling never changes. Come, follow me, walk with me, know me, and fish for people. Bring as many as you can into the family of God. And may it be said of them, us, as it was of them, that they were astonished, the world is astonished, and took note that these had been with Jesus. So what's my invitation? How do you apply this today? It is really quite simple. It is really, really simple. Psalm 1 is rooted in this idea of a person who walks, sits, and stands. And blessed are the ones who don't walk and sit and stand with evil people. 
But the inverse would be, blessed are those who walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, who stand together in fellowship and worship, and who sit together and have conversations of the divine and the wonderful works of Jesus Christ. Blessed are those people. So I'm gonna invite you to something, church. Um, we, We live in a day and age where people are scared to commit. I want you to commit yourself to something. Matt Kuhlman is our group's pastor. Chantel Van Dyke is our group's coordinator. I want you to sit with others other believers and be in a community of relationship. We'll form groups this fall, more and more groups coming together, and our content in groups is is connected to the stream of content of teaching and devotions. You'll be in the Word of God, and you'll walk privately in your own devotional life with Jesus and develop that prayer life and talk with him and listen to him and let him teach you. What did God say? Listen to him. Jesus is the word made flesh. So the word of God, the Bible, is a holy inspired book. Read those gospels, get into them. Let the word of God speak into your life. Let that happen. Walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and then get to church. Get into church. I don't care where where you gather. If you're in a place far from here and you, you wanna gather with more people, invite them to your house. We'll send you a Starbucks gift card to buy the coffee. I don't care. We want you to gather and stand together and worship. Stand together and worship God in community and then sit together in groups and go through the content and wrestle with it and struggle with things you maybe don't know and maybe don't understand, but let God reveal and speak to you because one day, my friends, we have to give an account for what we did with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we listen to him in this story, we know one thing, we're gonna fail him miserably, but he hasn't failed yet. He doesn't fail us. Man, I... I I love that news because I know what a failure I am. I know all the areas I fail in, but I look to Jesus, I'm like, he just never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Friends, he won't fail you. He won't fail you. But the question of the follow me of Jesus is laid out before you. Will you walk with him? Will you stand together with us and worship him? And will you sit together and discuss and and pour over the scriptures and be in a community that loves and celebrates you? Will you get into a group? I'm challenging you. Info at foundrychurch.net. Send an email. We want to be in a group. We want to get connected to the body of Christ. Get involved. Pick up a devotional, those wisdom books on your way out. Be a church that walks with the Lord Jesus Christ because one day, one wonderful day, I guarantee somebody's going to save your life. I don't know. I worked with them for a long time, but it was very clear they walked with Jesus. May that be said of you as it was said of the disciples, very ordinary men called by an extraordinary God whose purposes were beyond what we could ever quantify or imagine. Our moment is here. How will you respond to the come? Follow me of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, it's in your name we pray that you would um, do all things and work all things together for the glory of the name of your Son, whom you love and in whom you are well pleased. So today we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would speak a word over us, that you would challenge us out of our complacency and into a living, active relationship with you, with your word, with your church, and with a group. Help us walk with you. Help our lives take an unexpected turn. May by the end of this day, we say, that is not what I had planned. By the end of this year, may we be saying like, I just didn't plan to be this close with a group of people. May by the end of this season, we find ourselves walking closely with you and unexpectedly, overjoyfully exclaiming, this is not what I had planned, but I am so thankful for your plans, Lord Jesus. May we participate and follow you as you call. In Jesus' name, amen. So Peter fished for a living. That's what he did, and I probably assume that's what he thought he would do for the rest of his life. But then Jesus came and asked Peter, Peter, will you come and follow me? And Peter immediately left his nets, and he followed Jesus, and his life was changed. What he thought was, would happen in his life didn't come true, because now he was following after Jesus Christ. And the same question uh, is for us to answer today. Will we come and will we follow Jesus? Will we spend time with him? Will we have personal devotions where we're in the scriptures, where we're praying, where we are listening to what God is calling us to? Will we pray throughout our days? Um, Because the more time we spend with God, the more and more we'll be transformed into his image and become more and more like him. So I encourage you to spend time with the Lord throughout your day. And I also want to encourage you just to get involved um, with a group and in a community. 
I'm here at the Foundry Church. We believe that it's important to be in community with one another, um, to challenge one another, to encourage one another, to talk about the scriptures, and, and just learn from one another. And so that's why we highly encourage groups. And if you are worshiping with us in Washington or Florida or uh, New York, wherever it may be, we want you to be a part of a group. Um, we have content here at the Foundry that I would love to send your way. Um, and whether your group starts with um, just the people that you're worshiping with out in that place, or you want to do it Zoom, whatever, we'll make it work. Um, so send me an email if you'd like that content online at foundrychurch.net, and I would love to send that out to you and just have more discussions with you about what a group could possibly look like in the situation you're in. All right, and as we go from here, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you have a prayer request or you'd like to pray with somebody this morning, you can text the keyword Foundry online to 94000 and press the number three key. And um, it is August and we are quickly making our way through the summer here in Michigan. Um, so get outside, enjoy the weather because we know fall comes next and then winter. So we don't want to rush it. So get outside, enjoy it. Thank you for worshiping with us. And I hope you have a great week.